Hello and welcome. My name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water. Some people like to call me Rabel. So uh, just get that out of the way. It's Rabel. And I'm here with my good friend, Brian Demers. Would you like to introduce yourself, Brian? Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Demers. Uh, I, I grew up with power, uh, also sort of in the sticks in Maine, so the other part of the country, but you know, still, still in the north, I would say, right? Yeah, we're both from the north. Today, we'd like to present 10 excellent ways to secure spring boot applications. And you should know that this is based on a blog post that I originally wrote with Simon Maple, good friend of mine, fellow Java champion, and he works at a company called Snick. Um, you can also call that company Sneak, I've heard. So it's uh, it's ambiguous, kind of like Brian and I's last names. I call Brian Demers all the time, but it's or uh, Demers, right? But it's Demers. So it is Demers. Uh, if, yeah. you, if you'd like to read instead of watch, you can Google for this blog post and find it, or click on that link at the bottom there. And uh, Simon and I wrote this at JCrete, which is an awesome conference in Crete. And so just want to let you know that, that if you want to read it, you can. And so 10 excellent ways. We're going to start with uh, one of my favorites, and that is to use HTTPS. And so HTTPS in production primarily. So the only reason I didn't put production on here is if I had put in production, it would have slid across the Octa Aura on the right there. And so didn't want to do that. So uh, also called TLS. That's the official name for HTTPS. And you might have heard it called uh SSL in the past, right? Secure sockets layers. And that's the deprecated name. So it's a cryptographic protocol that provides secure communication over a computer network. Uh, its primary goal is to ensure privacy and data integrity between computer applications. And as of July 24, 2018, just a week before this original article was published, uh, Chrome now labels HTTP sites as not secure. Uh, so try to use HTTPS as much as you can, especially in production. And, uh, you know, Let's Encrypt offers free HTTPS certificates, so it's very easy to use HTTPS and TLS these days. It used to be that uh, certificate authorities would charge you a fair amount of cash for an SSL certificate, especially a wildcard certificate for all your subdomains. But now you can get those for free from Let's Encrypt. Uh, you can use CertBot to uh, generate certificates um, from Let's Encrypt if you want. And there's also a tool that I like to use locally called MakeCert. So MKCert, um, you can use to create local, local host certificates. And so that works better than generating them like with the uh, Java SDK because MakeCert actually adds them to your local CA, Certificate Authority, on your operating system. And so you don't get this prompt in your browser that says, you know, do you want to proceed? Like it actually works through and through. So that's pretty nice. And there's also a Spring Boot Starter Acme. ACME stands for Automatic Certificate Management Environment for automating renewing those certificates from Let's Encrypt. So you could uh, you know, add that to your app and then you won't have to worry about doing it. My personal website on rabeldesigns.com, my hosting provider actually just has a cron job that goes out and renews the certificate every, I think, 90 days. And then you'll have a nice logo like you see here on the bottom of the slide that says, hey, you're, uh, you're encrypted. And I'd also recommend, uh, if you don't know a lot about HTTPS, there's a howhttps.works, and that is a valid URL. .works is a valid TLD. And it's fun because a cat explains how HTTPS works in a comic. So uh, you could even, you know, maybe read it to your kids or go over on an iPad at night with your kids. It's kind of like a bedtime story. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, if you're using uh, Spring Boot, which I assume you are, otherwise you wouldn't be at this webinar, uh, you can force HTTPS in your Spring Boot app by extending the Web Security Configure Adapter and overriding the configure method and then saying, you know, requires channel, any request requires secure. So that's an easy way that it will actually take, if you, you know, tried to access the app, app with HTTP to redirect you to HTTPS. And so if you're on localhost 8080, It'll go to 8443, and so it automatically has that mapping. If you're on 80, it goes to 443. And if you want to do any custom you know, uh, ports, then you might need to configure things a bit different. And what I recommend, like I said in the beginning, is only use it in production because even though you can use Makesert and run it locally, and it's pretty easy in you know, development, uh, a lot of times it 
can be a pain with a self-signed certificate. So um, if you're using Heroku Cloud Foundry or most of the cloud providers, this code here, using looking for the exported proto header, will actually um, indicate that the client is trying to access with HTTPS and it'll force it to go there. And so this is a configuration that I use in most of my projects. So now I'll turn it over to Brian for the next excellent way to secure your Spring Boot app. All right. So uh, next up, you need to make sure where you're scanning your dependencies for vulnerabilities. All right, so all of our applications contain dependencies, and we need to make sure they're safe. Right? Historically, this has kind of been difficult. I know when I first started out, we used to just check jar files into source control, and uh, with no version information, it was it was basically impossible to figure out which versions you had running and. And that led to a whole bunch of other nightmares. Um, but then along came tools like Maven, and maybe we're going the other way, right? Now it's too easy to add uh, dependencies to your project. So now we need to make sure they're safe, or something like this might happen, right? So everyone's heard of uh, the, Equifax, the Equifax breach a couple years ago. There was a stretch two vulnerability, and Equifax didn't patch their service on time, and, um, and then they got hit. So their service, uh, the, sorry, the vulnerability had been released two months prior, and they hadn't updated their, their service. Um, but if we think about it, right, like, Matt, do you have any applications running that have been running for two months? Oh, yeah. I got, they've been running for 10 years. Right, right. So so, <laughs> so we need to make sure we're, we're updating everything and, and making sure that uh, we both you know, are, are checking for our dependencies for issues and then updating them after the fact. Um, so let me slide you over here. So here's a timeline of the attack, right? So, sorry, the timeline of the CVE. So on March 10th, the official CVE notice went out. So that's when, you know, basically the world found out that there was a problem. And then less than two weeks later, you have a giant spike in attacks. So if you think about it, that's really your window, right? Is, is it's less than two weeks. So we need to make sure you can both find the, find the issues and then, uh, update your application within two weeks, you know, obviously sooner, sooner when possible. Right. So this is your application, right? Your whole glorious application, your code, your dependencies, everything inside of that. However, the little dot in the middle is what's actually your code. So in a very real sense, your dependencies are, are more important than the code you write as it's a bigger surface area. So, you know, our code is standing on the shoulders of giants. So I have this little example here. Uh, and Matt, you, you may be able to tell right away here, but uh, I have 19 lines of code. How many how many dependencies in Node do you think I, I have? I see two with the requires at the top there. Yeah, spot on, right? So yeah, so two two direct dependencies, right? So you, like like Matt said, you can kind of cheat and just look at the top. But how many total dependencies do you think I have? So, you know, my dependencies and their dependencies and those dependencies, dependencies, and we keep going on and on forever. The transitive dependencies, I'm going to guess maybe five. How about 19 total? Whoa. Right. So that's one for every line of code. That's that's a pretty good ratio. <laughs> um, but it, it gets even, it gets even more interesting. Right. So how many total lines of code do you think this is? Mm, if you count all right, because JavaScript doesn't have binary, so it's source code. So let's yep. go with uh, two thousand. All right, you're close, almost two hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's ten ten thousand times more code than I wrote, right? So it's 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 very difficult to uh, to keep track of all this. So in in some communities, right? So in our Java, in the Java community, Node and in Ruby, most of our dependencies are indirect or transitive. It becomes harder to manage them because generally we don't we don't think about them, right? We just think about I'm going to depend on my favorite library and that's all I care about. But that's that's not really the case, right? Because those transitive dependencies could have issues, and because it's it's complicated, you know, you kind of need a tool to manage this for you. So as Matt mentioned before, our friends over at Sneak or Snick. I'm going to call it Sneak. Have have a great little application you can use to scan your dependencies. So I'm going to jump over to my browser and I'm going to share my screen. Here's a little dashboard. You can see the the these demo projects that I have in here are are filled with issues. 
Um, that way you can see. Hopefully your real applications don't have this many issues. So I'm going to jump into this one called Spring Goof. And you can see, I think I clicked on it. There we go. You can see there's there's some serious issues here. So there's 13 high severity issues, six medium and two low. So you can see the types of issues we have here. We have some deserialization issues, um, remote code exploitation, um, and, and a bunch of other things. So, you know, the the quick demo is I want to fix as many of these as possible with as little as effort, right? So I'm going to click the open a fix PR button, and this takes a few minutes or seconds anyway, because uh, like I said, this it, this this repository has a few issues. So, SNCC is going through and trying to see which ones it can fix. And hopefully by the time I'm done talking, it'll it'll pop up and it'll show me a list of everything you can automatically fix for me. And there we go. All right. So as you can see here, so these all of these issues can automatically be fixed for me. And there's a couple here at the bottom that have partial fixes and some that I would have to go in and fix myself. So there's no there's no known issue or maybe maybe requires some sort of custom code. But you know, 80, 90% of this is all done for me with the click of a button. So all I need to do is click this open a fix PR button and it'll send me over to GitHub and most of the, most of the code will already be taken care of for me. So if we jump back to our slides, I think you have some tips for us, right, Matt? Yeah, so when we started writing this presentation, we thought that we would include a bunch of, you know, hacker tips, but then we were trying to make you more secure, not less secure, and we don't want to have people hacking into stuff. So we decided to include some life hacking tips. And so the first one I would like to make you aware of is that you don't have to fix your socks. You can fix your toes. So if you have a hole in your sock right around your big toe, like this picture shows, you can just grab a Sharpie, preferably a dark one, and then, you know, color in your toe and no one will even know that you have a hole in your sock. So uh, I, I really like this. I generally travel with a Sharpie. How, my socks are white, but I mean, I think it could work, right? Right. You could, well, maybe white out would work better for those, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next up is we have, you need to make sure our libraries are updated. So I sort of hinted about this before. We found issues. We found vulnerabilities. The next step is, you know, update them. So we all know in the in spring world that starting a new project and keeping it up to date or starting a new project with the latest dependencies is really easy. You can just go to start.spring.io and click on the green button and you'll pretty much know right away you have all the latest dependencies. However, you know, two months rolls around, you probably want to keep updating them, right? So well, how do we do that? That cool button at the uh, the bottom there, the control space, the explore button, you could you could look at that and copy and paste the Newer dependencies, right? That's one way. I like that. That's a, that's a great idea. That's a, that's a relatively new feature, right? Yeah, that's only the last couple of months, I think. Yeah, it's good. All right. So we need to make sure we have good dependencies, right? So how well do you know your dependencies? Are they healthy? You know, did you get them from a trusted source like Maven Central, or did you download them from some random Bitbucket repo you found on Stack Overflow? I know, I know, Matt, you would never do anything like that, right? Never. Right. All right. Me neither. Um, so, so here, some other tips to make sure that your dependencies are healthy. You know, you want to make sure that um, the project has regular commits, regular releases. They have some sort of active uh, mailing list or, or Slack or some other forum you can go ask questions and get help. And does that project itself include other random, you know, may, maybe questionable transitive dependencies that would get sucked into your application? And if any of those things, you know, raise flags, maybe you don't want to use that project. Or maybe you want to jump in and help, you know, if it's an open source project, you can contribute fixes for them, and then, you know, everybody's better off. Luckily, there are some other great tools to help us out. Uh, so in the Node community, you can use NCU to, to list whatever Node packages you need to be updated. Maven, we have the great versions plugin. So I know that this goal here, the display dependency updates, will just show you a list, a report. And then there's also one, uh, there's also another goal to apply those changes to. And then of course, Gradle has a similar tool. So moving on to uh, more of the web side of things, I tend to like both the back end and the front end, but uh, one of the things that can happen with front end applications is CSRF. And so that stands for 
uh, cross-site request forgery. And it's basically an attack that forces a user to, un to execute unwanted actions in an application they're currently logged into. So let's say you logged into your bank and then you went to another malicious website and they happen to have an image that's hidden on the page and references your bank website. Well, they can read the cookie then and actually, you know, maybe go and, you know, change your password or change your email on your bank. And then all of a sudden they've compromised your account and they can make withdrawals and no one really wants unauthorized withdrawals from their account. So um, if it's a normal user, a successful attack can do just state changing requests like transferring funds or changing the email address. Um, but if they have elevated attack, they can compromise the whole application, right? If it's uh, like a bank manager that's logged into the banking app and someone, you know, gets their credentials, then uh, that's bad news. So you definitely want to protect from CSRF. And so the slide here says enable CSRF. And again, I eliminated the protection part, but maybe I should have put on there because you don't really want to enable CSRF. So with Spring Security, it allows you to do that, again, by ext extending Web Security Configure Adapter. And if you happen to be using Webflux with Spring Boot, there's a way to do it there as well. The main difference between your security configuration with Spring Security in Spring MVC versus Webflux is you'll extend Web Security Configure Adapter when you're using Spring MVC. And when you're using Webflux, instead of using Enable Web Security, you use an Enable Webflux Security. And then you'll have beans that override specific behavior. So a little bit different configuration, but for the most part, it looks pretty similar. So they have excellent support for CSRF in Spring Security. Um, if you're using Spring MVC's form tag, for instance, or Timeleaf, and enable web security like you see here, the CSRF token will automatically get added to all your requests as a hidden input field. So that's great. And if you're using a JavaScript framework like Angular Reactor Vue, um, you will actually need to configure something like this. So in this case, what I'm doing here is I'm modifying the CSRF configuration to say that send the cookie with HTTP only false because HTTP only true is the default. And if it's HTTP only cookie, the JavaScript can't read it. So the JavaScript will be unable to read that CSRF token and send it back. So if you're using Angular, Angular is really smart and it reads what's called, the name of the token is XSRF-token and it sends it back as an XSRF token header. And if you're doing something like React, you might have to do that yourself, view, uh, similar, but you can do that with interceptors pretty easily with all those frameworks, and uh, and then you have CSR protection with your JavaScript apps as well. So I think Very this was cool. one of Brian's life hacks here. Yeah. So a little while ago, my wife started getting into tennis, right? So my basement is filled with tennis balls, right? right. So uh, you know, storage became a problem. So I found out how to cut my storage in half, right? So I can fit twice as many tennis balls in a package now if I just cut them in half. Right. And she um, probably thought and, you were a genius for that, right? Oh, she loved it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, it didn't start with tennis balls. So I, I play a lot of ping pong and I can cut those in half too. And I can fit like a thousand ping pong balls in a little box. Beautiful. Good life. It's hack. great. All right. So use a CSP as another one that's for web applications. And what a CSP stands for is content security policy. And so what this can do is prevent XSS attacks. And it basically is an added layer of security. XSS stands for cross-site scripting and data injection. So this will often happen in applications where you've put it out there on the internet and you've been successful. And then someone at your company decides to add, you know, some tracking or something like that. And maybe one of those gets compromised because as developers, we never put any malicious JavaScript code in our apps, right? We always use frameworks and you know maybe we source them from a cdm but usually maybe we source them locally and you know we know that they don't have any vulnerabilities in them well everything's successful until you go to production and marketing gets involved and then they start these third-party tracking tools and you know maybe those get intercepted or compromised and so what a, a csp allows you to do is say only these you know only uh urls from these cdns are acceptable and so you can basically control the JavaScript that gets executed. You can also control what JavaScript can do, right? Can it do an eval and can it do some more, you know, security related things? And you can also even do this with a meta tag in your HTML page. So that's pretty handy. But Spring Security uh, has a bunch of headers by default. So 
these are the default Spring Security headers once you integrate it into your Spring Boot app. So it's it turns off caching and it you know allows no sniffing of the content type and it denies the X frame options and you know does a little bit there, but there is no content security policy. So what you can do is again extending Web Security Configure Adapter. It's part of the DSL, so you can say HTTP.headers and then content security policy. And so if you just did that first part that says script source self, that means that the only JavaScript that can be loaded is from the same domain that you're on. And so that's uh, obviously a good recommendation, but chances are you'll have to tweak things a bit to say, hey, it can come from this you know, CDN or it can embed you know, a Twitter uh, tweet or if you want to embed like YouTube content, you might have to do the object source and then you point it to your report URI. And so um, I recommend that because it's pretty easy to do. And then you'll know when people are trying to add third party scripts to your application and, you know, you'll block them by default. And then you'll have a conversation with marketing that, you know, you need to fix the app or add them in there. And a lot of times this can actually be done on the web server layer. So if you have, your Spring Boot app running, you know, behind something like Nginx or Apache HTTP server, then, you know, you can configure these at that level too, instead of doing it in your application. And securityheaders.com is a great way to test your CSP policy and uh, even test your site to see if, you know, you've done a good job of securing things. So there's a colleague of ours that wrote this blog post on how to configure bed, better website security with Cloudflare and Netlify and you can see there the screenshot shows that he started with a D. And by the end, it was this slide that I showed previously, he gets an A+. Plus. And so, you know, a lot of that was configuring on the server level rather than the application level. So you can certainly do it that way. But Spring Security offers a lot of those features as well. So you can really improve things um, just by, you know, tweaking either your server configuration or your code itself. And it, it's easy too. So Matt, um, I, I updated one of my sites uh, recently and I read through the blog post. It took me longer to read the blog post than it did to actually fix the problem. Right. And I, I check every you know couple of months on my site to make sure it's there. But you know I have a guy who is my hosting provider and I can just send him an email and he fixes it. So that's even easier, right? If you have right. that luxury. All right, so we have another another trick for you, another life hack. Right. So sometimes I just can't leave my office. Right. I'm busy. I, I have stuff going on. Um, you know, maybe I'm recording a webinar, you know. Um, right. So when I get hungry, I, I like I like my snacks to be warm. So I just take two laptop chargers and I put my my snack between them. And in a few minutes, I have a nice, nice toasty snack. And uh, I have a, a laptop dock, a laptop. I can't talk laptop dock that gets really warm and it's got gr like a kind of a grill heat sink on it. So it leaves, uh, I can make a grilled cheese right on it. It's great. Nice, nice. I've even seen something similar that's, you know, this is, uh, I don't know if people actually use it, but have you heard of people doing road trips and heating things on their engines? I've seen old uh, military footage of this, yes. I, I have friends that do it right now. Like they'll take <laughs> uh, like grilled cheese and I think they wrap them in tinfoil or whatever, but they'll stop, you know, after a couple hours, throw it on the engine. That's a good life hack for some lunch. I even saw one recently where uh, uh, they'd used, uh, what's it, a French press, but they filled it up with water and threw some hot dogs in it, and then, you know, heated hot dogs. So there's all kinds of ways you can heat up a snack. All right, my next road trip. I'm going to try that, that the car one. The next tip for securing your Spring Boot applications is to use OpenID Connect for authentication. And a lot of the reason for that is because when I was an independent consultant, I did that for – about 19 years before I joined Okta, what I found was I worked with a lot of enterprises and they would keep their users often within the app. And some of the smarter enterprises would keep their users in LDAP or some central store uh, for the company. And that was more logical. And then once I you know, joined Okta and learned about OAuth and OpenID Connect, it was like, wow, this is so much better because first of all, you're storing them external to your app so you don't have to worry about authentication and authorization. But second of all, you can blame someone else if there's ever a breach, right? So that's it's always a nice thing to do. So just to give you some background on OAuth and how it came to be, um, when back in 2005, 2006, when you would sign up for a Yelp account or a LinkedIn account, you'd basically get to the end of your sign-up flow, and it would prompt you, do you want to 
add some more of your friends, you know, to Yelp or to LinkedIn. And what it would do is it would give you a dialogue that would show you your Gmail username and password. I think Yahoo is probably an option too. And so people would, at the time, just type in their username and password because why not, right? It was familiar and you trusted Yelp, you trusted LinkedIn, but there was no guarantee that they didn't keep your password, right? And so maybe every you know couple months they would go out and see if you had any new contacts and suck those in and then send them an invite to join and become your friend. So um, that led to basically wanting to do delegated authorization where you could actually have you know someone like Yelp say or give Yelp access to your contacts without you know giving them your credentials. So uh, that's where OpenID and OAuth came about. It started with just OAuth, and so OAuth basically had this flow that allowed you to get access to someone's contacts. But what happened was there was no identity information, and so people that were implementing OAuth, namely like Google, Microsoft, and Facebook had a way where you could do pseudo uh, identity where basically they had a slash me endpoint and you could use your access token and go to that endpoint and get information about the user. And people basically said, hey, this, you know, this isn't part of OAuth because OAuth is not an authentication framework or a protocol. It's, you know, mainly just for authorization. And so that's where OpenID came. Those companies got together and said, let's create OpenID Connect. And OpenID Connect is based on OAuth, but it's just a thin layer on top of it, and it gives you the ability to get identity. So to go through this OIDC authorization code flow here, there's many different flows that you can use with OAuth, but this is the gold standard. This is the most secure one, so that's why I'm showing it here. How it works is you'll be on Yelp, and you'll click a button that says connect with Google or log in with Okta or whatever, and you'll be redirected to an authorization server and you'll tell that authorization server what the app's URL is. So that's the redirect URI. And then you'll tell it standard scopes that OpenID provides. So in this case, I'm saying OpenID and profile. And so that'll give me not just like an email back or you know a user ID. It'll give me actually like a full name that I could use. And so the authorization server, if you're logged into it, you'll never see a login screen. If you're not, it'll prompt you to log in. And then it might give you a request for consent. And so the resource owner, that's you, that's you who clicked on the button initially to connect with Google, and they'll say, do you want Yelp to give you access to your public profile and contacts? You click yes, and they'll come back to that redirect URI. And so at one point, you registered Yelp with Google, and so they know they have a white list of redirect URIs. So if the redirect URI doesn't match, that whole process will fail. It'll come back with what's called an authorization code, and then you can use that code to go and get the access token and the ID token. And then you'll come back and you can, you know, display information from that ID token. But you can also go to that user info endpoint. So I mentioned the slash me endpoint. The slash user info endpoint is, you know, the new gold standard for that. So that's how OIDC and OAuth works. And again, the only difference is OIDC, you get an ID token and the scopes are standardized. With Spring Security, they have open ID connect configuration built in. So that's awful handy. You'll see here uh, the key is kind of long, spring.security.oauth.client.registration. And then we have Okta here because it's one of their native supported uh, OpenID Connect providers. There's also Google. Um, I don't think Twitter's in there because they're not OAuth 2.0 yet. But, uh, I think but Facebook's in there too. I need to find a client ID and a client secret. And then you also have a provider key with an issuer URI that points to your issuer. So that's all pretty easy to do. And then you can actually uh, have a Groovy class. So this is a, this is an easy way to run a Spring Boot app that you know only 10 lines of code here actually goes and gets that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show how to actually do that. And uh, you can see here that uh, I'll just create a new directory called demo. See the end of that. And I'll create an app dot groovy file. So I got the code here, so I don't have to type it all out. I can go ahead, paste that in there. And so Spring CLI has a tool that you can run, spring run app dot groovy. And so I haven't set up anything. And the reason I want to show you this is because Spring Security 
by default, if it doesn't have any configuration for the issuer URI or for the uh, the client ID and the client secret, what it'll actually do is give you its default login screen, which is just form-based authentication. So if I open up a browser here and go to localhost 8080, it gives me username and password. So if I type in user as a username, go back to my console here where the password is. All that will work. So it's smart enough to know that, hey, you haven't configured anything for OpenID Connect, and, uh, and therefore that works. So if we were to go back here and cancel it, and then um, I have this environment file here in another directory, so um, at no IDC demo. And what I've done here is I've set up some environment variables that match uh, an app that I've already set up on Okta. So you can see here's my issuer URI and my client ID and my client secret. And so I'm doing a no-no by showing you my client secret. So I'll have to go and delete the app after this demo. But uh, now if I source that, OIDC demo, okta.env, and then run spring run app.groovy, it'll actually use OIDC for authentication. So I'll probably have to use a uh, incognito window because you know we don't want to uh, have my last session still be active. So I'll go new incognito window and then localhost 8080. And then if I log in with my credentials, It'll come back, and you notice that in the code we had principal.get name. So this is what comes back. It's just a unique identifier for the name. So if we actually want more information, what we can do is we can actually go to Spring Initializer, and we can create a new application. So I have a shortcut for that, and it's called Boot Start. Let me show you what it looks like. Boot Start, and so this is hitting start.spring.io, and it's downloading a app that has Okta and web already included. So I can just run boot start. And then I can unzip a demo and dash D, we'll call it Java boot. So if I go into Java boot, the cool thing here is what I can do is we have an Okta Maven plugin that you can use not only to register and create a new account, but also to register your app on Okta. So if I were to run MVN, uh, com.octa and then octa maven plugin setup this will go out to octa and it'll prompt me for some things some information about myself so my first name my last name my email and then company is uh, octa of course and then i can open this up in intellij and I'll create a home controller that, similar to what we did with Groovy, it'll return the actual person's full name. So just to show you some Spring security features where they make it very easy to get more information about the user itself. So this is over here. Come on, IntelliJ. That's my favorite ID. Mine too. I, I don't think there's there are any other options, are there? No, there is, but, you know... Once you get comfortable with one, it's tough to switch to another one, you know? Absolutely. So back to my desktop where I got some sample code here just to make life a little easier. Here's my REST controller. And this is also a cool feature of IntelliJ. If you just, you know, you have a Java class, maybe you're looking at one of our blog posts and you just want to copy and paste that, you can copy and paste that class and it will go ahead and create it for you. And even adds a package, right? So... Um, then we got to do some imports. It adds those in there. And you can see this authentication principle is, uh, is a pretty nice annotation um, that you can use from Spring Security. And then OIDC user is one that you can get a full name from. So now if we were to run this app, then we should see you know the person's full name instead of just their other name. And that Maven plugin went ahead and added the new app that it created for us 
into this client directory or into this application properties. So now if we were to go new incognito window, do localhost 8080, we're already logged in. That's the beauty of single sign on. And now it shows, you know, my full name instead of just that sub. So that's awful handy there. So the Java version I showed actually uses our Spring Boot starter. So that was automatically added when we specified Okta as a dependency from start.spring.io. And Brian's a maintainer of that, so you know it's good code. And uh, and we use many less properties. So with the uh, if you're using raw, you know, Spring security, you have uh, if you're using YAML, you got a lot of code. If you're not using YAML, you only got three lines. Um, and ours is, you know, three lines by default or five lines if you're using YAML. So we're a little more concise and uh, and that all works nicely. And it works with Spring WebFlex. So I wrote a blog post about this and I've written several since uh, that use Spring WebFlex. In fact, for the last couple of weeks, I've been integrating OAuth support for Spring WebFlex into JHipster. If you haven't heard of JHipster, Google that. It's a cool project to combine Spring Boot with many front-end frameworks like React and Angular and Vue. And it works really nice. And... Uh, and yeah, check it out. On to you, Brian. All right. So many of us are still dealing with, with managing user passwords. Um, so my first suggestion is stop doing that, right? So Matt just showed you some great ways how to do that with OADC. Um, but if you're still dealing with legacy applications and you're still managing users and their passwords, you must hash their passwords, All right? So the typical story is... I, I go to a website, I forgot my password, I mash the I forgot my password button, they send me an email, that email contains my password, my old password in clear text, right? So that's a very bad situation. They should have never had my password in clear text to, to, send, to send to me. So the, what they should have done, obviously, is send me you know a link or an email um, that I click on and I you know create a new password. But let's talk about what hashes are. Right, so a hash is a one-way cryptographic function. So you have some data in, and you get some unique, well, some uh, identifier out. Right, so that that string that I get out is unique to that what I put in. And there's no way to unhash that value. So there's no way to recover uh, my password from a hash. It's just just a hash. They're deterministic. Right, so if I have put the same input in, I get the same input uh, same output so this is great because if i have you know say username and password form matt maybe you you know fill out your username your password like you did on that that your first example i'll take that password and i'm going to hash that value and then i'm going to compare that hash with the hash i've stored in some database and if they're both the same then i'm going to let you into my application and they're not predictable you can't guess the hash right so here on the left we have tsd0 tsd1 so this secure developer. And if I change one character on the input, the whole entire hash changes, right? So I can't, I can't guess them. And all of these makes for a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So one password or one input equals one unique hash. So that way there's no, pa there's no collisions between passwords or, you know, me logging in with a super secure password is not going to collide with Matt's maybe insecure password. So doing this in, in Spring is really easy, right? So it's just a bean. Spring security provides implementations for you. So in this case, I'm going to use Scrypt, but it's just a bean. Everyone knows how to create this, and using it is is just as easy as any other any, any other bean that you're currently using. So in this example, I'm auto wiring. Don't hold it against me. Um, you can use constru constructor injection too, but this fits on a slide much easier. So I'm just going to call the encode method of my password encoder, put a string in, get a string out, so I'll get the hash the hash value on the other side. All right, so this is a uh, life hack that I only recently learned, and uh, I've learned you can do it with uh, seafood as well, and uh, it works even better. So you can clean hard-to-reach places in your car. I have an old Volkswagen van again that you know, gets dirty all the time, and I just take a you know warm piece of chicken out there and... Uh, and go ahead and get the dust out of the door handles and off the dash, and it uh, works really nicely. That's great. I know my vehicle is pretty dirty right now, so I'll, I'm going to go get some chicken. <laughs> All right, so most of our applications contain some sort of secret, 
All right, so Matt just showed you his secrets for his ODC application. I hope you go change those, Matt. All right, I got to go delete that right now. Hold on. <laughs> um, but, you know, your application might have database passwords or API keys or some other secure data, right? And you need to make sure you're storing that securely. Matt, have you ever checked in uh, a secret accidentally? Well, I think I did it yesterday. <laughs> so it becomes really easy to find these things, right? So I can yeah. just search GitHub for remove passwords, remove password, and I can see, uh, you know, all of these commits that literally tell me what what ha what happened. And I can go click on the diff, and I can see the old password, right? So so a hacker could just troll through this really easy. I mean, this would take someone five seconds, and uh, and see the old password. So you need to make sure that if this happens to you, you revoke any old API keys and change any passwords. Right. And if possible, you should probably um, change your, your history as well. But depending on your repository, that's that may not be possible. So luckily, there are some tools to help you out with this. Um, so this one is Git Secrets from AWS Labs. So this runs as a post commit hook. So it stops you from pushing anything that looks like a secret to your remote repository. So you should install this and it runs locally. Um, if you haven't looked at post commit hooks, uh, I would recommend them for a variety of things. I know Matt and I work on a project where we do some basic linting, and it's prevented me from um, checking in some some silly looking code. So it, that's that's definitely helped me. And there's also other tools too, like Git Rob will uh, will scan your repository's history and look for secrets. So how do you store them? Um, HashiCorp has a project called Vault. And it's great. You can store secrets. You can set um, leases and TTLs on them, so your applications only have access to those secrets for a certain duration. And of course, Spring, Spring Vault is an abstraction layer on top of that um, to make it natural, uh, naturally fit into Spring. So you probably already know how to use Spring Vault if, if you've ever used an at value annotation. So I'm sure you have a lot of code like this, Matt, between various projects, maybe not called password, but a lot of a lot of uh, uh, add value annotations, right? Right. So this one might look a little silly to some people because I'm using character right here. But that's very much intentional. For passwords and other secrets, you want to try to use character arrays whenever possible because the alternative of a string, strings are immutable, you can't clear the data. And another reason is passwords can accidentally, uh, string passwords can accidentally be printed. So, you know, if you're logging or emailing or uh, hopefully you're not emailing anything with secrets in it, but uh, any any other data that you're, you're logging, the string will print out obviously in clear text and the character array will print out the hash. All right. And this is one of my personal uh, favorites is testing with ZAP. So ZAP stands for Z Attack Proxy. It's from the OWASP project, which you might have heard of, Open Web Application Security something project, right? So I just guessed and I got it. Uh, so it's a it's a proxy that performs penetration against your live application at runtime. So before you go out and hire a, hire a penetration testing team, you might just want to run this on your application first. And uh, it's popular uh, on GitHub, open source. It's got over 4,000 stars and uh, and works quite nicely. So just to show you an example, I ran this. Uh, this has been a few years, but I, I developed an application and then ran it. And it's got uh, it's got two approaches. So one is a spider scan. So this is probably a good idea to use if you have mostly a public site. So maybe you have forms. Maybe you allow anyone that's anonymous to sign up and do things. Um, so you basically get a bit of a seed of URLs, and it goes and crawls all those URLs and tries to do things on those various pages. Versus an active scan, what that does is you will you'll set up. In my case, I set up Firefox to proxy to Z Attack proxy running on port 9000, and it recorded all the data that went through. And so this is called an active scan. It records a session, then plays it back, and it looks for unknown or for known vulnerabilities. So in this case, you can see that I had a whole bunch. And uh, there was cross-site scripting. There was directory browsing. So if you went to just a URL and and that you know the user could see, um, it would list the files. So that's that's a bad thing to have, right? Because people might actually be able to see the file contents before they've been processed. Uh, parameter tampering was allowed. Um, and uh, I had cookies that didn't use HTTP only. Uh, cookies that didn't use a secure flag. And one of the easiest ones to fix is a password autocomplete in the browser. So that's autocomplete equals off. It's an attribute that you can add to your 
password fields in HTML. And, uh, and I was able to run this and then go fix all of those, you know, in a matter of an hour. And so you can learn more about it from its homepage, which uh, isn't very uh, user friendly or memorable, but you know, that's the nature of, I think the software they're using to host it um, on GitHub. It's ZA proxy slash ZA proxy. And I would recommend, you know, following them on Twitter, at least for a bit to, uh, to learn more about the project and, you know, try it out because chances are you might have some stuff that, uh, that it can actually identify for you. So, yeah. So next up, um, Code reviews. So you want to have your security team do a code review, especially, you know, of the security related code you're writing. Right. So code reviews are are one of my one of my favorite things. I, I think they're a great opportunity to learn both for the, the author and the person reviewing. So there's a great two way communication if you can if you can do them right. Um, so we have a top 10 list of things to look for when you're doing a code review. So first up, you want to identify and validate your inputs, right? So your inputs could be anything. They could be some other system, maybe from a database, maybe a REST API, right? That data that's not yours, you didn't control it, so you can't trust it. But obviously, user inputs, query parameters, HTTP headers can be changed and manipulated by the client, uh, as well as any files that are uploaded. So you need to make sure any files are, are clean and and sanitized. Um, and if you're just extracting zip files, you want to watch out. So I have a quick example to show you. Let me jump into my console. So you have this Java goof example, and I'm going to open up a zip file and show you its contents. So I didn't know till, until recently that VI could open zip files. And now it's my new favorite thing. So you can see this zip file has two entries. So I have a good dot text. If I open that, maybe. Uh oh, what I do? I don't know what happened. Some the demo gods are cursing me. So that is actually supposed to be just a regular a regular text file, and hopefully this one will open. And of course not. Let me uh, let me try to do this again. So you're saying you got VI to open your zip file once? <laughs> What's that? I'm saying you made it work once. Yeah, it, it worked. So, whew, that's terrible. All right. Well, this worked five minutes ago. So anyway, you can see here that uh, you can see the directory listing. So this one, the first one is just a text file. It's a normal everyday file. But the second one is a, has a path traversal, right? So if I extract this file and I'm not paying attention, then I'm you know going to traverse up up the up the my directories and then back down and replace potentially this native to ASCII script, which in my case is just uh, a script that says "gotcha," right? But this you could be replacing, you know, maybe some depending on the access you have to the system, you could be replacing some important system files, or you know, maybe the next time the the application is restarted, you replace um, you know the Java executable, or you're doing something. Right, so you need to make sure you're not you're not doing any of these things, and we see these things in Java because Java doesn't really provide a high level uh, unzip tool. All we have is the the pieces, right? So it's really easy to crack open a jar or a zip file and go through it, but there's no way to extract those. So you have to write all that code uh, yourself, which means that you know there's an opportunity there for something to go wrong. So let me get out of this this failed example here. <laughs> and go back to my screen. All right. All right. So we've talked about the next couple, right? So don't store your, your credentials as, as configuration, especially in your repositories. Um, we've showed you how to test for security vulnerabilities. Matt showed you how to authenticate. So you need to make sure you're doing these types of things. The, the fifth one here, you want to make sure that you, know, you restrict your users to, to whatever the minimum set of privileges they need. Right. So if your user needs some read access to a resource, you don't need to give them admin access. Right. So you want to narrow, narrow their scope. Number six is another one of my favorites. So use a whitelist instead of a blacklist. So a few years ago, the project Jackson Databine, which I'm sure most of us know, it's a very popular project and it's a it's good, good project. But they were trying to use a blacklist to detect attacks. So 
quickly that that didn't didn't scale right because there's almost an infinite possible possible options for that you could put on a blacklist um, so what you want to do instead is use a whitelist and only allow what you're expecting and the same thing with security right so user security if you're trying to log in a user check if they have access you want to make you want to check if the user has access not if they don't have access so these next couple should should be obvious too right so handle sensitive data with care you don't want to log people's passwords or any other uh, maybe you know HIP, HIPAA related uh, objects. I, I feel terrible that we have, even have to suggest this, but obviously don't write you know don't put backdoors in your code or you'll end up on the front page of Hacker News. And there then you want to you know test against well known attacks and make sure you're just regularly doing some static testing. So there's some great tools for that too. I've been using uh, Spot Bugs, which used to be called Find Bugs. And then there's a, a security-related version of that. So find security bugs is a great um, Java project that will scan your code and find some, some issues like weak hashes and, and a lot of other great things. So those, those are the top 10. All right. So just to go through and give you a recap of what we talked about today, use HTTPS in production, scan your dependencies, keep your dependencies up to date. Uh, I think uh, GitHub now uses Dependabot by default for a lot of new repositories. So uh, if you're a public repo, you should have those updates coming in. Enable CSRF protection, not enable CSRF, <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. Use a content security policy because it's pretty easy to add. Um, use OpenID Connect for authentication. Hash your passwords. Store your secrets securely. Test with OWASP Zap and code review with experts. And so when we first created this, uh, Simon was nice enough to create a Spring Boot security cheat sheet. So if you actually want to print all these out and put it up on your wall, you can do that. There's a, there's a link at the top. It's a little blue there. Um, but, uh, but you could also just probably Google Spring Boot security cheat sheet and find it. Don't allow your lack of security to be disturbing. You'll notice I'm wearing one of these shirts today. We love it because it's, you know, Star Wars theme and, uh, and they're pretty fun. So if you see me or Brian, at a conference or on the street one day, uh, you know, let us know that you saw that we recommend these shirts because we might actually have one on us. This is and true. Our last life hack is uh, this is a great one: is to use a toilet seat for a TV dinner setup. So uh, you know, if you're traveling on the road and you can rip that sucker off, works kind of nice. If you have any further questions, you can reach out to us on Twitter. My DMs are wide open at mrabel, and I will also tweet out a link to this presentation where you can view it online in PDF form on Speaker Deck. Actually, if you go to that link right now, speakerdeck.com slash mrabel, it is already published there. And uh, you can follow Brian and I. And Brian actually just published a YouTube video yesterday on five Java tools that he likes to use uh, in his projects. And so we post a whole lot of code on github.com, Okta Developer, for Spring Boot, for Spring Webflex, and for a lot of front-end frameworks as well. And so before we end this, there was a number of questions that came through on the Q&A, and I answered a few of them. And so this will likely be pushed to YouTube as a video afterwards. And so YouTube, I don't think, is going to see any of the Q&A, but maybe they do. Um, but maybe, Brian, there's a few unanswered here that I think are, are kind of added for you um, about hashing and Maven. So if you want to take those, I'll, uh, I'll answer. Yeah, so sure. Well. So... So one of them um, that I, that I just noticed um, is 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 hash is the hashing technique using a specific algorithm? Um, yes, and so so there are a few different um, hashing algorithms. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Spring Security provides most of the defaults out of the box for you. So that's something you don't have to worry about. The actual implementation, you know, those are those are well tested, uh, and it's one of those things you shouldn't write yourself. So there's no way to decrypt them, and but the type of hash depends on what you're doing. Um, but generally, I think scrypt and, and bcrypt are are sort of um, a couple of favored ones. And I think just recently the SHA SHA one had a, the first official attack. I think last week maybe. So um, so someone was able to craft a a collision with a, a SHA one. So. You know, obviously, you should be using strong, strong hash algorithms. Well, so so uh, can a hash be decrypted? No, 
I did mention that, like I said, MD5 and, and SHA-1, there are some some uh, forced collision attacks that can happen to these older ones, these older algorithms. But now that we're the um, you know, newer algorithm, there's no known attacks for them. Oh, go ahead, Matt. No, no, go ahead and uh, answer those other ones. I believe, you know, now that I remember that the audience view and I think the recorded view has these questions and answers that pop up. But go ahead and uh, answer those ones that you were going oh, to all right, so somebody mentioned the um, there's there's a couple other goals you can use for the Maven version plugin. I strongly suggest anyone just Google Google Maven version plugin. There's a bunch of goals to to fit a variety of needs. Um, I use that project all the time, so so definitely go check that one out. Uh, somebody somebody gave a thumbs up for for Bcrypt. They're they're using Bcrypt. They'd recommend that. Uh, someone asked here about my existing on-premise SSO uses a header-based approach. Um, can I use OIDC? And so you could probably use OIDC. Uh, it depends on if you're able to go outside your firewall. So someone like Okta, if you want to use Okta for authentication by default, you would need to give users access to, you know, access Okta, um, which would be outside your network. Uh, we do offer something called Okta's Access Gateway that can make this work uh, without going outside your network. Um, but you can also use an OIDC provider like Keycloak and install that locally and then don't have to go outside your network all right there's another one for you matt are there cases where we need to use uh cross-site uh scripting when we're on different servers well so you won't really want to use cross-site scripting ever you want to prevent cross-site scripting right but uh but maybe what you're referring to is cores so cross-origin resource sharing uh this used to be a thing that browsers didn't allow and now they do and so there's a header that can be sent from the server that says hey you know this client can access our resources and it's okay. So um, you might have to configure cores with Spring Boot. There's actually, a, I think it's what, cross-origin annotation that you can use um, that will allow, you know, someone using an Angular app on a different port to, uh, to talk to your site. But as far as like a CSP, a content security policy will only pertain to your, your particular Spring Boot application. So you might have to have a CSP for your Angular app or your, your React app as well if those are on separate applications. And then You'll probably want to use like Nginx or you know Apache to configure that rather than doing it in Spring Boot because you won't be using Spring Boot if it's on you know CDN. So I think we answered most of this. You got the hashing ones right. You just did those by voice. Yep. And the Maven ones. So I think uh, I think that's it. Hopefully you got answers for the other ones you asked. And uh, like we said, this will eventually be up on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube.com/c/octa-dev. Uh, that's O-K-T-A-D-E-V. We will post this as a video up there, and you can ask more questions on there if you like. You can also post questions on the blog post, and we'll answer them there. And uh, feel free to hit us up on Twitter if you like as well. So thank you for attending, and uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone.